This is the Best Health Podcast, brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health in partnership with MedCost. Good day. Welcome back to the Best Health Podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening out there. Um, For our uh, latest episode, we are going to be talking with Dr. Linda Nicolotti. So welcome, Doc. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, um, I appreciate you being here with us today. Um, So what we're going to talk about today here in a second uh, for everyone listening is, um, you know, what what has been kind of the topic of the day here lately is COVID-19 slash coronavirus. And um, there's a lot of information out there. Some of it is accurate information. Some of it is less accurate. Um, so I'll just start off by saying um, we encourage everyone to go to wakehealth.edu slash coronavirus. And that is a great resource uh, that's been vetted by our experts here at Wake Forest Baptist Health. We have a myths versus facts um, fact sheet on there. Um, we have some other contents, some videos, informational videos. Um, so I encourage everyone to check that out and, and get some good, um, uh, accurate information. Now, Dr. Nicolotti, I'm really excited that she's joining us because she's going to give us um, some specific insight in, um, in how to talk with children about COVID-19 coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you just want to start off, Doc, by giving us a little bit of background about yourself. Mm-hmm. and um, what you do day to day and and how you got into the healthcare healthcare field. Sure, be happy to. So I'm a pediatric psychologist. Mm-hmm. I work at Wake Forest Baptist Health in the Department of Pediatrics. Mm-hmm. And at the hospital, I do a number of different things. So I see inpatients on the medical side. I also work in the gastrointestinal pediatric clinic a couple days a week, and then I have a caseload of patients that I see as well. In addition, I'm the section head for pediatric psychology and behavioral health in the Department of Pediatrics, and we have a growing team there. Great, great. That's good information. You know, we're so blessed to have the resource of Bernard Children's Hospital in this area and all the expertise and knowledge uh, that comes with, with that. So. We appreciate you taking time. I know it's a busy time for you. Um, so I'm just going to start off uh, just, you know, people listening, they, they might have a different uh, understanding or might have different levels of information about coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, but at the basic level, you know, and this has come up in my own house with my with my children, um, you know, how do we, if, if the kids haven't already brought it up themselves, how do we break the ice, so to speak? How do we even start having this conversation? It, it seems to have taken over our media cycle. Mm-hmm. They're probably hearing about it at school from friends or staff at school, and who, you know who knows what their friends are saying. So, what's kind of a good initial first baseline step to take? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. By this point, probably most children, and especially older children and adolescents, have heard about COVID nineteen. Um, and probably have some thoughts, questions, feelings about it. So I think it is a great idea to bring it up with your children, keep lines of communication open. Um, You might start off by asking them, you know, what they've heard about it, what they've seen about it, what people are saying about it. You know, do they have friends or peers at school who are talking about it? Have teachers mentioned anything? Have they had any exposure on social media or seen any news snippets from it? Gotcha, gotcha. So um, based on kind of the answers they give back to you, um, what's what's the, the best next step to, to take with them? Should we kind of sit down and have a family meeting? I know, you know some kids might be nervous that... You know, they hear about this this virus that they don't know much about. Do they maybe do they think they have it or they're going to get it? Um, would would you talk about that and kind of how to talk to them yeah. about that process? Yeah. So I think that question brings up a few different issues, yeah. perhaps. So to help kids feel more um, safe with it, um, definitely finding out what their concerns are. Mm-hmm. Um, I think presenting facts to them based on 
what they know and clearing up any misconceptions that they talk to you about, I think is important that they're getting the accurate information. Um, helping them know the facts that children appear to be less likely to get it, also tend to have more mild cases, may only be symptomatic for several days in the best case scenario if they do get it. And that you and doctors and government officials and schools are actively working on keeping them safe. Mm -hmm. And there are things that they can do to keep themselves safe too. So you can practice with them and talk about appropriate hand washing, hygiene, using Purell if it's available, um, letting you know if they feel sick, if they're getting some symptoms, okay. or letting teachers know. Um, also just generally avoiding people who are sick, the social distancing that's been talked about. So there's lots of ways that parents can help children feel safe. Sure, that's, that's great information. And to kind of follow up on that, so um, you know, if you have children in, in, in your household or, or come in contact, or you know, if you're a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, um, you know, you're probably going to talk with a seven-year-old differently than you're going to talk to a 16-year-old about this. Correct. So if you want to touch base uh, on that, just kind of age-appropriate conversations sure. and content, mm -hmm. and um, what parents can maybe uh, take a, some guidance on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think lots of families have children of different ages and developmental levels, so it's important to take that into consideration, as well as just a child's personality and whether or not they may have some anxiety to start with. I think generally for younger kids, it's important to give more concise information, tell them what they need to know, answer questions that they have, but give them more simple and direct answers. Older kids and adolescents are probably going to be more sophisticated in their knowledge base. They'll probably have more informed questions. They're probably going to want more detailed information. They've probably read or seen more about it. So I think in most cases it's appropriate to give older kids and adolescents more information. And a good rule of thumb to guide parents is that if children or an adolescent is asking a question, then it's usually appropriate to answer it honestly. Um, and also just keep in mind, try to avoid presenting too much information at once as mm -hmm. that can tend to overwhelm children. Okay, so maybe break it up into little, little nuggets of information that you share along the way. I think that's a good idea. Okay. So, you know, to the, to your point of, of old teenagers or, you know, it seems as kids are getting smartphones younger and younger and younger these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're older, they probably have, chances are they have a smartphone and they have social media accounts and they may have seen some information on social media. Um, so I think the your point about providing accurate information um, as opposed to what maybe they read on social media that might be true or not, right? Right. Yeah, I think having that discussion with your children, because I know a lot of younger kids do have access to social media, even if they're using a parent's phone. So I think it's important to find out what they've been reading about, what they've been seeing, what they've been looking at, um, and it's important to help them decide what's fact versus fiction. Sure. And, um, you know, I think maybe you can help us understand this a little bit better too so you know as as adults you know the, the quote-unquote grown-ups we we have mm -hmm. we're adulting we have we have the quote-unquote real stress right we have mm -hmm. jobs we have bills we have you know whatever is happening in our day-to-day -day lives and I think sometimes some adults are um, you know they might be quick to say if a kid is having some sort of stress um, or anxiety um, it might be dismissed maybe a little quicker than it should. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as you see, I'm sure day in and day out, anxiety and stress are very real issues mm -hmm. for, for some children. Um, so how would this international, you know, the, the World Health Organization has identified it as a pandemic now, mm -hmm. you know, adding, this might add stress to someone, especially children who might already um, have some sort of anxiety or, or stress in their life. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that and, and how we can address that as parents if, if that is a situation that we face. Yeah, I think 
stick to the facts is always a good idea. For kids who tend to be a little more anxious about it, I think letting them talk about their feelings is important. Validating their feelings is also important but also helping to dispel any rumors that they may have or misconceptions that they may have. Um, You know, kids with anxiety tend to focus on the negative thoughts that they're having, and those thoughts tend to come automatically. So helping them find other things to focus on, other distractions, and really limiting exposure for those kids, I think, is a good idea. Sure. So and, and I'm sure you, you do this in your, your daily job, but there's, there's methods and practices in place um, for children experiencing anxiety um, for, for to help them kind of work through those anxious situations, mm-hmm. right? Um, so do you, I know, you know, you can talk for hours and hours about that, yeah. but are there a couple of kind of just quick, you know, practices that, that you like to give to parents when you're out talking to parents mm-hmm. about you know, here's what we can do. We can, you know, redirect or, or whatever. Some of the, the top kind of right. pieces of advice you give just in general for anxiety. Yeah. Well, for, I would say maybe more mild or moderate cases, um, try to get your kids to talk about what their thought processes are. If they're able to identify that, like what exactly are they worried about? Um, that gives you some information so that you can try to talk to them about fact versus fiction. I think that distinction is important in in thinking rationally and thinking about what is more likely to happen, even though there are certain possibilities out there. Focus on staying safe, I think, and what they can do and how they can control that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Just for example, by, you know, washing hands before they eat and um, maybe after being out in public. Um, is one way they can get more control. Um, I think for parents who are wondering, you know, does my child maybe need more professional services? How can I tell Mm -hmm. when that might be appropriate? Mm -hmm. Um, You can look at any kind of changes in your child's behavior or mood. Mm -hmm. Um, Pay attention to their sleep. Are they having more trouble sleeping? Has their appetite changed? Do they seem to be having less fun? Are they having more difficulty focusing on schoolwork? Mm -hmm. Do they seem more distracted? You know, if that persists, um, then it's probably time to bring it up with the primary care doctor, and that may indicate that more professional services would be helpful. Sure, sure. And, you know, just as a quick aside, if if people have questions about that, um, you can, of course, find information on on the Wake Forest Baptist Health website, Mm -hmm. weckhealth.edu, as well as the Brenner Children's website. Um, So feel free to go to those websites and and check out some of the information we have. Um, We're back to COVID-19 and coronavirus. Doc, what, you know, it's it's, uh, almost seemingly constant uh, information coming in now. It's, it's, taking up the bulk of time on the news cycles. Yeah. So how how often should we talk with our kids about this? I mean, is it do we talk about it every night at dinner? Do we, you know, bring it up and then try and not talk about it again? What are your thoughts there on that? That's a good question. Um, it's such a rapidly developing situation, really especially is. in our community right now. And so I think um, the news is changing hourly sometimes, at least daily, we're getting new information. So I think for older kids, um, you know, touch base with them every few days, check in, see, you know, have they heard anything new? You know, you can talk to them about any new developments, again, to make sure that they're sticking with the facts. For younger kids, it may be best to stick with need-to-know type information, um, but still check in with them periodically. I don't think it's probably a good idea to make this the focus of dinner conversation. I think it'd benefit kids to keep dinner conversation a little lighter, but also touching base to see if they have any new concerns or new information. Well, you know... Dr. Nicolotti, this has been really helpful. This is something that, you know, has happened in my own personal household, and I'm sure it's happening, um, you know, the conversation is happening around thousands of other households in around our area and in our community. So 
Um, we appreciate you taking the time today and visiting the Best Health Podcast studio. Um, you know, in closing, what what going forward and and, and there's you know next week or in two weeks or in a month we're not sure what the mm-hmm. situation is going to be, um, but just kind of as a a departing question would be, so your kids, um, in, in my own personal experience, and you you jump in and off, please offer your professional mm-hmm. thoughts, but you know kids are pretty resilient, um, and they they are um, they're more observant maybe than we sometimes give them credit for. Sure. Um, so, you know, what are your advice? What's your advice to parents about how parents conduct themselves? Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, should I guess we want to evoke a, a calming state, if if mm-hmm. at all possible, around the household. I think that's that's good advice. I think um, it's best if parents can be mindful of their own behaviors and their own conversations. Sometimes we feel like kids aren't listening. Maybe you know they're in a different room and we think they're out of earshot, but they still are hearing what we're saying. So I think for parents just to be mindful of that and of what message that their own conversations or behavior might be sending to their children and um, to help try to manage your own anxiety about it. Because I think as we're getting more and more news, and if, if the stores, store shelves and um, lack of Purell and toilet paper is any indication, yeah. I think people are, are worried and, and they're doing their best to prepare. But just be mindful of what message your preparations might be sending to kids and don't overdo it. That's great advice. I think, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, as we said earlier, feel free to visit wakehealth.edu slash coronavirus for the latest um, uh, information that our health system is is sharing with the community about best practices for for COVID-19 and coronavirus overall. Um, And um, we'll keep adding resources such as podcast links and videos and and more information um, to that website as we get more information to share. So I want to thank you, doctor, for joining us today. I want, I want to thank everyone for listening out there. Until um, we talk to you next time, please be well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Best Health Podcast brought to you by Wake Forest Baptist Health. For more wellness info, check out wakehealth.edu and follow us on social media. Wake Forest Baptist Health, the gold standard of healthcare.